everyone and welcome to our Victoria Art Gallery Q&A. I'm here with John and Jim, two Jays from Victoria Art Gallery, and I will hand over now for John and Jim to introduce themselves. So over to you, John. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, I'm, I'm the gallery manager and I've been doing this post for uh, this role for um, quite a long time. Um, December 96 I arrived and um, uh, so I managed the building, um, which is in the middle of the bath. Um, next to the River Avon. I manage the staff, I manage the budgets and, um, and the exhibition programme which is a really important part of what we do but we also have a permanent collection. So, uh, so we're kind of two levels, you know, we, we're, one level is the collection, the other, the other level is the exhibitions. Great, thanks John. How about you Jim? Uh, hi, I'm Jim. I'm the Museum and Exhibitions Assistant which um, means I look after the collection and also help out with exhibitions and sort of do all sorts of things. I haven't got quite as many years under my belt as John. I've, I've been there about a um, year and a half now. So still sort of learning the ropes a bit, but um, yeah, really enjoying it. Great, thanks both. So we asked you to send us through some questions on social media. So um, here we go. We'll be Well, I've dabbled in art, I think. Um, I would definitely consider myself an art lover. Um, I've been going to museums and galleries for as long as I can remember, and that's what I really love. Um, I love the stories. I love um, observing the arts. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I did do Excel at Art at School, and I remember doing an art foundation course, and, you know, I really got into art at one point, but... Um, I then did an art history degree and, you know, that's when I found out, you know, I really do enjoy going and looking at art and, and learning about stuff, you know, going, you know, going to museums. I, I fall very much into the art lover category, but my first ambition was to be an artist. Everybody wanted me to be an architect, uh, <laughs> but um, I got as far as an interview at the Slade School in London and they sat there thumbing through my sketchbooks and they said, uh, ooh, ooh, we think you're more academically inclined. And, uh, and that was actually a turning point because I had no imagination whatsoever as an artist. And I think, and I think actually, as looking back, it was really good advice. So I studied art history and then um, you know, I, I, I did a museum diploma. And then I got my first job in a museum, which happened to be in Leeds. Um, and, uh, but art has run, runs in my family. And uh, my, my father was a, a kind of like a Sunday painter. Um, and, um, and, um, I come from a Quaker family, so um, my, my, on, my, on my father's side, they were all school teachers, um, Quaker school teachers, but they were real polymaths. Um, they studied nature, um, you know, birds and bees and plants, and, um, and actually became quite expert on the subject. My grandfather was broadcaster for the BBC in his, in his part, in part time. Um, uh, he used to do children's hour quite regularly. And, uh, and then, my, but it was really my father who turned to art, but as I say, at the weekends. And, um, but it was his first love. He, he worked in, in industry full time until he was made redundant. And um, then he became a teacher. So, um, but what I'm holding in front of me is um, a painting by my great grandfather, Charles Bennington, who was a Quaker schoolmaster in a rural area of Northern Ireland. And, um, and I just, uh, I've known this painting since I was a child. Um, and I inherited it from my grandfather, and it, it's actually a painting of the school where he taught, which is sadly now in ruins. But this is a little bit of my uh, inheritance, really, and a bit of the reason why I do what I do. I absolutely love it. Um, I have spent over a decade trying to get to this job and working in museums, volunteering in museums. Um, so. Now I've got this position, I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, I still can't get over the fact that I get to sort of look at art every day. That's brilliant. That's sort of um, what I do in my free time. I get to you know, get paid to do it. It's brilliant. Um, it's very strange at the moment because, of course, we're not allowed into the gallery, into the offices. Um, so I don't get access to the collection. So um, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of social media posts. Um, looking towards upcoming exhibitions and planning those for when we reopen. Um, so it's still very varied, the job's always varied, um, but um, it's a different sort of um, skill set required at home, I think. Um, so still answering queries and 
um, yeah, I've been doing a sort of an A to Z of the collections. I've been picking out sort of my favorite pictures from our collection and writing a bit about them um, and doing little caption competitions, all sorts of things. So yeah, I've been keep, kept really busy. Um, in terms of the art that we've got, we've got um, an extensive collection of prints and drawings. We've got lots of paintings. We've got decorative art. So we've got loads of ceramics, uh, glassware. Um, so it's a really sort of varied um, collection. I don't know if John would like to add any to, anything to that about the collection. Yeah, um, well, the collection, it, 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 it's massively varied and uh, in scope, it's, uh, it runs from the, well, the 15th century right through to the 21st century. So, um, um, and we've got decorative arts, we've got, uh, we got painting, we've got sculpture, um, glassware, ceramics and so on. Um, and uh, and it is, it, it's really, it's, it's a joy to work with a collection that is so varied and that has been founded largely by gifts and bequests from local people. So, you know, the reason we are where we are today is because local people contributed. And, uh, and you take our collection, something like as much as maybe 95% of it was either given or bequeathed to us by local people. And within that, you've got some absolutely gems of, you know, things like, there's a collection, for example, of Staffordshire dogs, you know, things that, because that, and which is very much in the nature of collecting because, you know, collectors have passions about one particular thing. And then, you know, um, when they die, you know, they're public spirited and they decide to give it to their local museum. We've got a beautiful Paul Clay painting that was given to us by, you know, a, a, a second generation Jewish refugee. I mean, again, it, 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 it's unique. There's nothing else like it in the collection. Um, but it, it was the thing that was, uh, it was because it was small, they were able to take it, take it with them in, uh, in their suitcase when they escaped from Nazi Germany in the 30s. So, so I think variety is a great strength of our collection, um, but it also speaks to the fact that it was formed from so many different sources. Yeah, I mean, it is a public art gallery, you know, so um, I think it does reflect the collecting interests of local people. Um, so I think that's quite an important aspect of, of the gallery. It reflects what people have collected, what they've loved and what they uh, feel enough about to actually preserve in a, in a gallery like ours. So, um, yeah, you know, that, that's our responsibility to look after, you know, that, those public um, artworks. But going forward, it's also one of the greatest pleasures and excitement because you don't, you, it, you, it's impossible to anticipate what might come your way. And as an example, um, a man who volunteers for us um, quite regularly um, decided to give us a painting um, that had descended through his family, a portrait of one of his ancestors, a female ancestor by Sir Thomas Lawrence. You know, a really prestigious 18th century portrait. And, um, and he still volunteers with us and he's able to actually, you know, uh, conduct tours of the upper gallery of our permanent collection and point out to people, well, this is a painting that I once owned. So, but, so he's got, so it gives local people, I think our community, um, a great sense of ownership of what we're actually displaying. Well, it's a good question and it is hard to quantify how many female artists' works are represented in the collection. Um, of course, John has just said that, you know, the majority of our collection comes from gifts and bequests. Um, so we don't have a large say in, in you know, the makeup of um, female to versus male works in the, in the collection. Um, we have got a um, number of female artists represented in the upper gallery uh, on permanent display, people like Emmeline Dean, um, Gillian Ayres, um, and we've had lots of recent exhibitions using our collection of female artists' works. Um, Adela Breton comes to mind, Rosemary Ellis. Uh, we've had displays on Emmeline Dean and Helen Lavinia Cochrane. So they're definitely an active and sort of um, very um, valuable asset to our collection. In terms of trying to quantify it, um, it, it's hard, it's very hard to do that. I think um, probably about 20 to 30% um, would be by female artists. Um, 
that is, you know, bearing in mind that for, you know, before 1900, the art world was overwhelmingly dominated by men. Um, so a lot of those female artists come from the last sort of 150 years. Um, but we've got, you know, 700 plus works by Catherine Kimball, you know, big, big collections. Uh, Adela Breton's got about 100 watercolours, which are truly lovely, really, really nice. Um, it's also worth noting that um, the gallery, when it was first opened, was um, founded really by um, a female sort of collector and philanthropist. Um, John knows a bit more about that, really, actually. I'll pass over to John on that one. Um, yeah, the, um, the reason why the gallery exists today is because it was um, the money to, 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 to build the building came from a lady of Scottish descent called Arabella Roxburgh. And uh, she died in 1896. And um, she, she was known as, in her lifetime, as quite a mean minded lady. <laughs> and then, but she left all her money <clears throat> to charity. And uh, which included, I think it was um, about 7,000 pounds to build an art gallery. So, um, so, um, <clears throat> and, uh, so, so that, that paid for the building uh, with a bit of money raised by the mayor as well. And, um, and, um, but the money didn't quite stretch to, uh, to do everything they wanted because they wanted to, as we're called the Victoria Art Gallery, um, it was appropriate that we should have A, a crown on the top of our dome and B, a statue of the Queen on the main facade of the building. And the money didn't allow for that. So the women of that, gang together and they actually uh, fundraised to pay for the statue. So the building went up in 1900 and then it wasn't until a couple of years later that the statue of the Queen was added. And we got coach trips, coach, um, um, coach tours go through Bath every day and they all stop outside the gallery to point out this amazing statue of the Queen, which is really lovely. Um, well, um, in terms of the type of art that we display at the Victoria Art Gallery, it, it's a really good question. And uh, I think to answer it in its simplest form, I'd say, I mean, you have to be an opportunist in my profession. Um, and, um, uh, and obviously, you know, with 20 or more years experience, I think you get better at that. So, so there's a I think it would be foolish of me not to say there isn't always an element of opportunism. You just have to be, have your radar out all the time uh, in terms of what opportunities are available. You know, whether you're borrowing things from public collections, national museums, regional museums, or private collections, or through links with, um, you know, through um, commercial galleries. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not fussy about who we get the art from. Um, but I am fussy about the type of art that we display. Um, and I'm always thinking about, well, what's going to appeal to the public? And as a curator or manager, my greatest reward is to see an exhibition or, or a display well attended. So I think as far as my taste is concerned, I would say it's very Catholic. It's very wide ranging. Um, and um, I mean, we do things that are fun. We do things that are serious. Like last year, we had a, a, an amazing painting by Nicholas Poussin um, of the Triumph of Pan, which was on loan to us from the National Gallery. Very classical painting, um, um, challenging in some ways, but very, very important, a real masterpiece. On the other hand, we had a an exhibition called Shamanka, which was a performing mechanical theatre with a soundtrack um, and an amazing uh, light show. Um, and we had, um, we had chairs set out in, in serried ranks, so people could come along, watch this performance for 20 or 25 minutes, and then go away. And they'd never seen anything like it, so that was something that was really fun, very different, and I think it was, you know, it came from a little bit of thinking outside the box and a bit of opportunism uh, on my part, um, because we had to bring all the artworks down from Glasgow to display them, um, but the public loved it. So, um, but and, uh, turning now to the question about um, who decides how we display things, um, I'd, I'd say, you know, um, 
it's always done in partnership. You know, we don't always know all the answers. So we work with a lot of contemporary artists. Uh, we work with the Bass Society, which is a, a, a you know, huge body of, um, of several hundred artists. Um, and, um, and, it, and when you're showing, uh, when you're working with living artists, they'll always have opinions about how they think the work should be displayed. And as much as possible, you take those on board. But I think I'd have to say that the gallery does retain the right to have the final say, because we know what heights things are best displayed at, you know, to make them accessible. Um, we, um, and um, we know what the lighting can and cannot do. But in some instances, the, the decisions are taken out of our hands because taking uh, with, um, with regard to lighting, um, there are certain artworks, particularly watercolors, anything on paper, because paper is an organic substance and it's very, very susceptible to damage by light, particularly ultraviolet light. So there are some shows where, that come from, to us from other places and we are told you cannot have light levels above a certain um, um, number of lux. Light is measured in lux and we have to adhere to those measures. Otherwise, we're not allowed to display the artworks. So you've got to work within those parameters, um, which is sometimes challenging. Um, but by and large, I think our public um, understand the, the strictures under which we operate. Once upon a time, I'd, I'd have definitely said yes. Um, um, I really enjoyed doing art at school and I went on to do an art foundation course at Bath College. Um, and that really for me was, I, I treated it a bit as a gap year actually, because I, I had an art history degree course was already, already set out. Um, but it was a sort of a last hurrah to see if I could be an artist or if it was what I wanted. Um, and I had a great time. It was, it was thoroughly enjoyable doing um, all the different types of art. So I remember doing loads of print work. And I think I actually, having previously done lots of painting, I then sort of decided I was going to specialise in 3D design just because I'd never done it. And so I thought, I'd give it a try. So I remember making this huge um, plaster cast of the interior of a shell, which was supposed to be a sort of um, a sort of living room light, uh, where the light would shine out of the interior of the shell. It, it was vast and incredibly heavy because it was made out of chicken wire and, and plaster. And um, I remember at the end of it throwing it down the stairs, actually, that was quite fun. Uh, so I have dabbled in art and I remember really enjoying life drawing. It's something I've not really kept up though. I mean, I do, I do still do um, art here and there. And I've done, I brought this to show you. And this is, um, uh, I did a lino cut recently. So well, during lockdown, been doing a few lino cuts. So that's an example of that, so a little badger. That's going to be a, a sort of birthday card for someone. I, I haven't decided who yet. Um, so yeah, still, I still try my hand, but um, I'm, I definitely need more practice, I think. Um, before I could say I could definitely paint or draw, but um, um, yeah. Well, I did art A-level at school and um, I'm a failed artist really. I mean, I, it, it was a passion for me, but um, um, as I've already said, I didn't really have any imagination as an artist. But one of the things that I remember very well was that, um, I mean, we had this, um, we had a brilliant art teacher and, uh, and uh, he was, um, I mean, he, he, he wasn't um, up front, but he was much more laid back, but he put materials at your disposal. And one of those, the materials that we had was like a huge stack of old Sunday Times magazines um, that he just brought in from home. And, um, and I can remember thum thumbing through those magazines when I was a sort of 17 year old. And it, um, I mean, I, I became quite good at copying, but, but that was it, that was as far as I went. Um, but more importantly, I think that a lot of the, that visual kind of education that I had through, the, through those magazines stayed with me for decades and is still with me to this day. Because, you know, I've shown, uh, we've shown at the gallery people like the photographer, Don McCullen. Well, I knew his name um, as a curator because, entirely because of my art teacher, Mr. Bryce's Sunday Times magazines, because a lot of Don's work was published in these magazines in the in the 70s and, uh, and 80s when he was at the height of his uh, sort of war photojournalism that he did. So, um, so, so 
I, so I'm, I'm not an artist, but I try and channel my creativity. I think I am quite a creative person. It doesn't come out in artwork, but I think it comes out through writing, through some photography, and, um, and also through programming, because I think um, programming does require, programming exhibitions requires one to be creative, to be imaginative, um, and to uh, and so so I think that think so I think I've channeled the skills into other outlets or I try to I don't know whether I succeed <laughs> our visitors are the best judges really great thank you Jim and John um, that was really really insightful hope everyone's enjoyed our Q&A and um, it's a bye from us for now bye, bye.